Thank you and welcome for tapping into some untapped tag. I'm one of your hosts, RJ Zimmerman, here with my good friend, Monte Ball. And we are very excited. To say, I hold on, you need to say hello. No, you're supposed, oh, to, you're, supposed to, you're supposed to say how you doing? How you doing? Oh, how, you, how you doing this morning? How you, you doing? always say that. I yeah, do. I'm doing well. Right. I did change. I'm doing it up well. On you. All is well on my end. I'm excited <laughs> for our guest. That's for sure. Yes. Um, and I'll, I'll let you go ahead and RJ introduce our guest. We are very, very excited to be joined by Amelie from twitch.tv slash Amelie of the Sea. How are you doing this morning, Amelie? I'm good. How are all of you? Good. <laughs> Real good. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You see us two knuckleheads trying to just still a year in, still trying to, you know, master our introduction. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But uh, different every very, time. Very, every time. <laughs> we're very, very uh, excited to have you. Very, very excited to have you. So uh, we got some important topics we're going to talk about today, huh? Yes, please. Yeah. Absolutely. Happy, happy to talk. Yes. Yeah. RJ, go ahead. Yeah. Before we get started, let's <clears throat> let's start with uh none of us are medical professionals. So when mm, you yes. hear our opinions and what we state, please, you know, know that it's more personal experience and um things that we have personally dealt with and it's not coming from a medical opinion. You should seek out a medical opinion if that's what you are looking for. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, so for myself, I I have a master's in social work and I'm an associate clinical social worker, but I am not a licensed clinical social worker. And the difference between that is that I cannot legally represent my uh, opinions and thoughts as professional consultation. So anything that I say here uh, should not be taken as if you were in therapy. Like this is not a replacement for therapy sessions or group Absolutely. therapy or any other form of professional mental health uh, rehabilitation. Yeah, okay. anything along those lines. Yeah. Yep, I'm glad you shared that. Um, very, very glad you shared that. I do not have those uh, as many credentials as you have. I am a certified recovery coach. So um, yeah. again, I'm glad that you shared that. RJ, I'm glad you shared that as well. Yes, we are not medical professionals, or at least. RJ and I most definitely aren't, <laughs> and we're just going to start sharing some of our lived experience. I'm just, um, I'm just a simple lineman. I see pole, I set pole, I see wire, I put wire in the air. That's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, pretty cool stuff. But let's go ahead and hop right into it, RJ. Um, RJ, you got the list, man. Let's let's yes, let's get let's dive right into it. Whatever, whatever you guys want to start off with. I, I like give me one topic. We'll go for yeah. an hour. <laughs> Let's do awesome. This. Awesome. So I'm like graciously uh accepted coming onto the show and um she has a lot that she wants to talk about. So let's try to get through what we can. I love the list that you sent me. Uh let's mm. start let's start with the uh strength the strength of perspective. Yeah, so uh, when I was getting my master's in social work, uh, one, of, one of the big things that we talked about was like the overall mentality uh, that we can take to our work. And so, so the, like, not, not just like, you know, the details of oh, how, how do you deal with clients and this, but like the, the overall mentality is what the school called the strengths perspective, which is, which is um, in every single, like for me, the way I internalize is for every single situation, how can you, take it and turn it into a positive growth opportunity. So it's, a ba it's basically every single situation, no matter how dark, how difficult, how painful it is, there is a potential for, for you know, uh, something that you can do positive. Like uh, one of the examples I was thinking about this is uh, as it relates to recovery. Suppose you're in the middle of an intense urge to, to use. Mm -hmm. Like that is, that is about as like painful as it gets, like, especially when it comes on suddenly and it doesn't go away. It's, it's right. really, it's, a, it's, a, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's, it's a very, very difficult experience, but yet even within that, there's a potential for you to do something positive with it. Absolutely. It, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not about what happens. It's about our response. Yeah. I like that. I do really, really like how you just, you just jump right in with that information because it's so important. Um, it's all about the, and you, you nailed it right there towards the end as well too. It's, it's that uh, stimulus, that stimuli. And then you have that gap in time between 
you know, the, the actual stimulus in your response. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that, that is actually very, very important. And that's actually some mindfulness as well, some mindfulness uh, techniques in that. Um, and so that, there is a lot of power in that, RJ. It's that when you get that urge, if you are just scratching, clawing, and want to get back to using, you have that gap, that time to figure out what it is you want to do with that urge. How do you want to, you know, how do you want to use that urge, use that, that feeling to maybe do something else, maybe to, to, to work on a project, maybe to rip up your carpet and put down some, some, <laughs> some hardwood tile. I mean, who knows? And so I, I think it's just important that you actually just mention that because it's different perspectives allow for us to, to grow. And that's important. Yes, that's yes. very important. Um, what do you think, RJ? Oh, that's, that's it's just, cool. yeah, I starting off with the deep nuggets right away. And I, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's something that we've talked about a lot, but we've never put it in such perspective that you just did is taking mm -hmm. everything and making positive light out of yeah. it. So like, yeah. and then another thing that we talk about a lot in the recovery and sobriety community is celebrating the little moments, right? So Absolutely. you have the urge, you don't use you. Let's say you pick up your new habit cooking. Let's say you pick up a habit that you've had. You jump into a story, a movie, a TV show. You know, let's say you watch The Office for the 75th time because it's just, it's chicken soup for your soul. You love it. You love what you're seeing. Celebrate that you didn't do anything with it, right? That that urge came and you were able to do something different. Right. Something mm -hmm. constructive. Exactly. Like that's, and even, even if, even if, let's say you relapse a little bit, you uh, fall off the wagon. Mm -hmm. It's not the end of the world. You take that. Right. Ne you take that next step, and you start all over again. That's not failure. Yeah. That's starting all over again, and that's getting. That's, that's also yeah. turning it into a positive too. So absolutely, absolutely. I, I like when, when I was when I was working in an inpatient. Uh, the drug now called rehabilitation center. What, what I was talking about. So these are people who are in very, very early recovery. Some of them had, had just come from like an inpatient where they went through withdrawal. So these were all extremely early. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talked about is that every single day that you are sober is a win. Yes. Like absolutely. every single day is a win. So even if someone relapses after 90 days, they still have 90 wins under the belt. Like, mm -hmm. like even no matter how, if they relapse a hundred times, two thousand times, those 90 days are still wins that no one else can take away from them. I like so that. that. That's a permanent win record. I like that. Absolutely. And thank you for sharing that. Cause RJ and I, here on tape, on tape, we talk about that, how it's a, uh, when you do have that relapse, when you do take that step backwards, it doesn't necessarily mean that that growing side of you is done, is over mm -hmm. with that. You can never regain it back or, or anything it, it's still there um yes. just like you stated yeah those wins are still there and that's actually a very important thing and we have people who listen in who ask us questions as to you know how do we move forward with still that urge to drink and maybe at times if we were close to relapsing or if we have relapsed how do we still work on moving forward and that's that's the point right there yeah still yeah can't take those wins away yeah, absolutely. You know, fall, fall down seven times, get up eight, you know, that, that type of mentality is like, it, it, like the, 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 the hard truth about recovery is that it is not an easy journey. Mm. So that, that is very, very, very difficult. And every single day, there's always going to be temptations The the reverse side of the coin is that every day there's a potential for incredible wins. So, yeah. So like every challenge you get is a challenge for you to knock, knock it out of the park, so to say. Right. Yeah. So, so it's, it's one thing I, it, this is also kind of, kind of the, um, the idea behind the concept of what people call motivational interviewing, which is a clinical technique that, uh, clinicians can use for, uh, people in early recovery, which is to help people like, uh, tap into strengths that they did not otherwise know or did not otherwise see as potential allies in their fight against uh, addiction. So, so yeah. Absolutely. That that's, Gosh, you you I'm already full circle here. Yeah, <laughs> really quickly too. It's I mean we're only about ten minutes in and just nuggets after nuggets. Motivational interviewing, RJ. We talked about that about a month ago, maybe a month and a half ago. It's yeah, that's so true. Motivational interviewing, really digging and prying. You know when you're working with this individual of trying to pull out of them what it is they want to do, 
which avenues they want to take, yeah, all of the above. Um, and you're right; they may not know that they have that inside of them, and and that yeah. technique is very powerful, very yeah, powerful absolutely. in all facets of life. Whether it's someone going through recovery, or if it's uh, a teenager not figuring, not really wanting to know what they want to study in college, um, all of the above. Pretty cool yeah, stuff. yeah, exactly. And uh, one of the things that really helped me when I was training as uh, in motivational interviewing was uh, learning how uh, how to ask good questions because there's a difference between like you know a questions that that can end up with someone feeling really you know on the defensive and feeling really angry versus questions that can be like really inspiring so it actually is just a slight change in wording so instead of using the word why we can use the word what or how so like if we start with our questions with what uh, rather than why justify justify why you know it's more like what can be so so an example is uh, what can be what can you do in this moment to help you get through it like so so that those are the type of questions that inspired the mind to search for those healthy answers yeah so so that those are the techniques that i, I trained in yeah that's fabulous mm -hmm. that's yeah. yeah it's all about those questions uh the Gosh, this is awesome. This is this is what we're talking about, RJ. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. And I'll shut up. <laughs> Just that that change in perspective, like you said, because if you continue and you ask why, it can almost come off as aggressive and attacking. Yes. You just change that to what? Yeah. And it just it goes, it's they're not accusing you. It's no longer accusatory. It's what is around me that I can I can change? What can I help? What can yeah, that's amazing. That's just that one word, the two letters, yeah. really. I mean, that's awesome. I'm yeah, this is fantastic. <laughs> I'm learning. Yeah, yeah. I'm enjoying this. So it's I like too. suppose suppose you know someone you're talking to someone who just relapsed. You know, you can ask them why did you do that. You know, and they could feel they would feel awful if you, if you like really get on the. It's like mm -hmm. okay, um, it, 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 like another an alternative is like okay, what were some of the factors leading up? Mm -hmm. to this incident like what 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 was like can, can you tell me what the background was and then and then they may be able to like they it, it may give them a chance to like actually you know go go through their minds and then also like why don't you just stop you you know that can lead them feeling defensive what uh, the alternatives like what can you do you know to help yourself get through this relapse period etc so the things like that yeah. yeah i mean i think it's important too that we're sharing this information to to our listeners because it's again they probably get tired of just hearing it from rj and myself but hearing it from someone like yourself who, who has an extensive background in 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 research mm -hmm. research with this information mm -hmm. is is wonderful so again we really appreciate this stuff this is awesome for let's, sure uh, let's get and to the next someone who uses words well too so yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah we're uh just you know two guys over here knuckleheads just not yeah. <laughs> Don't really do too well of um we use good we're working on we found that out last week <laughs> yeah yeah for, for me like i'm i'm autistic and one of the things that i struggle with is just communication and so one of the things i personally is that i just spent a lot of time trying to organize thoughts and how to like you know uh, share it in a way that that makes sense to people and that that is one of my personal self-improvement projects yeah so yeah, um, project. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Like that. So like we're we're always you know all of us are always you know uh, projects. Yeah, you know, like mm -hmm. it, oh, not sure. because like not because we're lesser than or anything, but because like we deserve continual positivity. Mm. So like we we deserve uh, our our own efforts to improve our own life. Like we deserve that, and that and that. Because I, I talk with clients and sometimes they're like, they, they, they don't feel like their life is worth it. They, they, they don't, you know, there's that like hopelessness mm -hmm. and, and trying to help them get around that corner to help them feel like they deserve to put in that effort. Not, like, even if it's not just for themselves, maybe to like help out, you know, a loved one, like right. they can get sober to, to be a better, you know, mother, to be a better father, to, you know, better family member, better friend, et cetera. Like just finding those reasons mm -hmm. and, and to, 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 to uh, truly and deeply believe that we are worth our own positivity. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. That's deep. Yeah. <laughs> That's deep, yeah. man. That is deep. RJ, go ahead, man. 
<laughs> I just feel like I've been wrapped in a warm blanket right now. Like, <laughs> this, this conversation makes me feel really, <laughs> really warm. It's re- it's really refreshing, man. It really yeah, is. It is. Yeah. The one thing I tell clients is that um, the the. Th- so, 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 he, so clients will often ask me, you know, are you in recovery? So they ask me like, you know, personal questions basically. Yeah. And so, so I try to help them like distill what, what, you know, what, what are their motivations for talking about that? And, um, let me see if I, if I can come back to the, so basically, um, what, what I try to talk to them about is that whatever they think of me and my background my prof- like at the time when i was working out my professional goal was to walk the talk because and the, the so this is like my explanation like because the things that we talk about are not just addict things they're human things mm. like addicts are humans you know like like everything uh that we experience like if it helps an addict it also helps humans and you know v- vice versa like these are everything that we talk about is a human nature thing. So everything that we learned about a human nature is, is applicable. That's very true. Thinking yeah. about it that way too. Yeah. It's, you know, people suffering from, from addiction. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're human, they're human. They're just, they're dealing with, uh, you know, their emotions. They're dealing with obviously the substance that they're using mm-hmm. and everything just seems a little bit more heightened. Yes, um, yes. at that level, everything's more heightened. And so, but yeah, that you're, you're so right. Self-improvement projects that, that, that's really sticking with me right now. <laughs> really <laughs> sticking, <laughs> really that's sticking. Good. What we got next, RJ? Come on. <laughs> so with this, uh, positivity <clears throat> and the strengths mm-hmm. perspective, uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. how does willpower can also help with, uh, recovery? Mm-hmm from substance uh, dependency yeah yeah so uh, so the idea is that i want to talk about a little bit the difference between positivity and like toxicity Mm. um so positivity means like trying to take trying to acknowledge how difficult the situation is and working with it versus like people who are just trying to suppress you know it's like uh you ever hear like people who who just like when people are having a bad time just like oh just suck it up deal with it it's it's okay you know the sun will rise tomorrow like they try to like just keep throwing like you know nice phrases at you but never actually addressing the problem so 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 uh, what i mean by positivity is like being able to like look for the positive things even in the difficulties and uh and so yeah so uh the way that reflects is that willpower is is a way that can help us uh, basically do anything and everything in these things in these in these uh, situations so the way i uh tried to describe it using an athletic uh uh analogy is that in the world of competitive athletics the role of willpower is basically the w- role that conditioning will have so the idea is that uh, an athlete who's very you know in good shape it, it doesn't solve any problem it's not going to win them the game you know it, like but having an athlete in very very bad conditioning it's not gonna go well like you think of like in the fourth quarter you know the game's tied you know like people are going for like the last minute you know uh attempt to win uh the conditioning is very very important when everything one's really tired like but uh, but like it's helpful to have that have that foundation so before we actually talk about it i actually want to define the three different types of willpower and then seeing how it affects our lives okay okay so the the first one is called the well i'm just going to give it a name there's different names like the first one's called just do it so it's it's like the nike symbol like you know like in the moment uh you're you're not sure if you want to put in the effort to something and it's like the just do it you know just give you that push to do something and then, and then the second type is the just say no type of willpower. It's like in the moment, if you're like you're trying to go away from something. So there are two different sides of the same coin. So just to move you towards a certain action, behavior, person, place, or thing. And just say no is, a, is something that moves you away from action, person, place, or thing, mm-hmm. et cetera. Yeah. So those are two in the moment. And then the third one's more like a mindset. It's called the it's worth it willpower which is it's a mindset that really defines how you're how you approach things like like an example that i give is um it's worth it for me to be a good family member 
So like in the moment, I might say like, just say no to say lashing out, like, you know, just snapping at my partner or something like that. What I can say, you know, just do it. The, I can say, you know, I'm feeling really upset right now. I just really need a few moments to vent. Mm-hmm. Like, so you can see like how all three can come into play all the same time. Like the, the mentality, it's worth it to be a good family member and then just say no to, to lashing out on my family member and just do it to, to asking for the space to vent. So all th- like the thing is, is when people actually do MRI scans of people doing these three things, different parts of the brain actually light up. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, really so, so, wow. Yeah. Th- there's actually, if you're interested in this, there, there's, um, there is a book called the willpower instinct. It's written by a Stanford psychologist at yeah, the willpower instinct. Uh, her first name is Kelly K E L L Y. And her last name is McGonagall. Like the Harry Potter, McGon- yeah. McGonagall. Ah, let's go. You see that right there. <laughs> yeah. Harry Potter up there. I like it. Great reference. Yeah. yeah so, so that, so these three things are really, really powerful. So again, again, it doesn't solve anything within addiction, but it's, it's important to have. It's just like how diet, having a good diet is not going to solve our life problems, not going to solve poverty, but like it, mm-hmm. it, it, it's helpful. It gives us a good foundation. And so, and so the thing is, is um, uh, I, I, one thing I want to talk about is the ways, like, uh, okay, let, let me try to reframe this. When we're in this situation of athletics, when we're talking about conditioning, one of the first things that almost every single coach will talk about is basic safety. Or like, you know, things that you don't do. Like right. if you're going to do a squat, uh, like be careful not to do this thing so you don't hurt your back. Mm-hmm. If you like do a push yeah. up, uh, bench press, whatever, like all the safety things. So when we're talking about working with willpower, I also want to talk about safety, like things not to do with willpower. So, so here's an example that, that you may think about, uh, like, let me, let me just say it. So suppose you see someone climbing up a ladder and you look at them and you yell, Hey, don't look down. You know, this is a universal thing. They're always going to look right. down. Right. So, let's say, let's so, say they're so, up a 65 foot pole working in the rain. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is so, you know, uh, psychologists, the, the thing is, is this story is very worldwide known because everyone relates to it. And psychologists have actually done a lot of studies about this. So, for example, what they did was they got some people uh, to sit in a room and they asked them to either say the following sentence to themselves or repeat in their mind or somehow, you know, tell themselves mm-hmm. the following sentence, which is, do not think about the white rabbit. Oh, and then tell them to like say that sentence a hundred times. Don't think about that so, elephant in the room. You're yeah, exactly. The elephant in the room. So, right. so this type of behavior is what guarantees willpower failure. So this is a safety no consideration. Kids. Just yeah, if you always... Them. Yeah, it's like, don't, don't do drugs, don't do drugs, don't do drugs, don't do drugs, don't do drugs. Don't do drugs don't do, like, if that's the only thing that we try to think about, that's going to guarantee willpower failure. Because if you think of, like, the just do it and just say no, like, um, basically, the just do it, just say no, like, think of it as a conditioning, like, it, it does wear out. It's a muscle, basically. Like, your willpower is, is very much a muscle. And if you always just try to use what, like, it, it just tires out. And it will eventually, in fact, the, the rebound is actually going to be worse. It's like, it's imagining if you push, if you try to push, like, say, a, a basketball underwater, like, the harder you push, the harder it's just going to bounce back in your face. So this, so people call this emotional rebound, or some other people think of it as reverse psychology, you know, all, all these type of things. So it's important to, it's important to not fall into that trap of don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Because this is what, because this is what we are kind of conditioned throughout the entirety of a life. Like if we get a new job on our contract, it's going to say, don't wear these things. You have to, this is a dress code. You have to wear this. Don't, don't wear that. Don't wear this. When you get a new apartment, they say, don't do this. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. So, so when I talk with clients, I talk about, okay, how can you, what can, what can you do in that situation? Instead of saying, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Because we know what guarantees failure, what could help you get a positive result. So, so that, that's what I've been working with, with clients. And one wow. of the things is use the other, use the other type of willpower, which is when you're saying, just say no, how do you, so ima- imagine if you're in a trap house or, you know, you're in a bar, just saying no is not going to help you at all. 
But what you can do is get yourself out of the bar. But like if you sit there and like say, oh, I'm, I'm okay, I'm okay. And like, you know, there's alcohol, everyone's just like offering you drinks. Like eventually the willpower is going to run out. But what you can do is like, okay, well, I'm, I'm unsafe here. I, I might relapse. Let me just get out of here, go home, you know, get away from like the, the, the dangerous situations that could, you know, get me to relapse or basically anything else in this world, you know, like that, that could be dangerous for me. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. So essentially, is this, please correct me if I'm wrong, is this kind yeah. of like the, you know, don't put your hand in the cookie jar, and then once you're told that, you really want to put your hand in the cookie jar now? Mm-hmm. And so yeah. essentially what you're getting at is, instead of just, like, being told that all the time, like, throw the cookie jar away. <laughs> or, uh, well, or hide well, it, throw it. In. <laughs> like, when, the, the analogy of leaving the bar, like, getting away from it. Um I might be wrong here, but again, so, I, I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn. <laughs> yeah. So, so here, here's an, so let, let's, let's, um, uh, let, let's, let's, let's use the cookie jar example. Like say, don't put your hand in the cookie jar. Okay. What can you do? Well, uh, how about, uh, do something else to, to, you know, give yourself a feeling of reward. Mm. Like, so, so uh, I want to actually reference, uh, the, something that the two of you said on last week's podcast, I listened to a little bit and both of you are talking about. Uh, things that you do when you feel urges. So RJ, you were talking about drinking Mountain Dew. Yeah. And Monte, you're talking about uh, just doing projects. Yep. So I want to kind of relate that to like what what can what can you do in the situation? So I, I try to relate this to like the five senses because it's easier. Is kind of remember that. So basically, the the base is like look for something that you want to do that's rewarding that can be easy to do. So 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 mm. so like so here's one of the things that is quite interesting which is um of the five senses the one that's actually the the strongest is actually smell and 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 taste like because you know taste involves smell so so here's an, with rj like here's like when you talk about drinking mountain dew like the the taste and the smell actually triggers the reward system and it helps you like actually feel rewarded like so, it's so an urge. Like when you have these urges, oftentimes it's like it's a desire for a reward, yep. like so, I, 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 or or desire for lessening pain. Yeah. And mm. so my one of my triggers is actually smelling like a really hoppy IPA beer. Yes. Because that's I loved to drink that. Like I drank it for the taste. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't mm-hmm. just drink it to you know get get to the feeling, even though it ended up going there. Um, that's one thing that when I smell it, it's pretty much an instant. I want that. So then, yes, yes. yeah, going, that's when I'm like, I order a Mountain Dew or I order some soda, maybe even a kitty cocktail, you know, with that uh, cherry juice underneath that Sprite. I just, <laughs> I, 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 I still love a kitty cocktail. I don't, that's fine. It's fine with me. You can laugh at me. <laughs> no, 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 so no, no, does, no. I'm not. That does give me that same kind of a, a reward without the, you know, toxicity of alcohol. So, no, I'm not laughing at the fact of you <laughs> drinking a kitty cocktail. I, I just never, I never thought that that's what you never knew. That's what you did. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, yeah. Um, like if we're, cool. let's say we're out to eat with family and yeah. I don't really just want to remove myself from the situation, but somebody with me is drinking a, a beer that I used to drink or like even like there's so many microbrews now compared to when I drank um, like a newer style with a that's an IPA and I can and I smell it and I get the whiff of it and I all of a sudden really start to to yes. crave that like I really right. want to yes. taste that I can I can mm-hmm. taste the bubbles in my like on my tongue still um, mm. and I, yeah. I, 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 kn- I, kn- I have a really good idea of what it's going to taste like in that moment I will either walk away and like go mm-hmm. outside for a breath of fresh air or something, or mm-hmm. I'll order a Mountain Dew or a Kitty cocktail. Like that's what's absolutely happen. right. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, one of the things that is going behind it is that our sense of smell is one of our keenest survival mechanisms. Because like imagine like what we're we're trying to determine what food's good or not. We, mm-hmm. Like smelling is what helps us. Like oh, this oh, this yeah. food is you know uh, rotten. Like we shouldn't eat it. Or on the converse, if you smell someone cooking up a delicious meal, you know, the the war, like, that is one of the universal, like, behavioral alterations. Like, Mm -hmm. think of, like, the most grumpy individual having the worst possible day, and they come home and someone just cooked up a storm. Imagine, like, the behavioral change on that person, right? Like, like, ooh, food time. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's, the sense of smell is incredibly powerful for that, for that reason. 
And then uh, for you, Monta, I would give a guess as to what, what I think could be happening is, is that uh, for you, as someone who uh, d did a lot of athletic stuff, like where a lot of your rewards came from physical movement. Yeah. A lot of a lot of what you were talking about involves physical movement, so touching, seeing, and like the way you like you kind of like uh, use your the your body to like uh, produce something positive for the world. Right. So you uh, are correct. <laughs> you are. Oh, oh wow, <laughs> that was deep. And you are correct. Yes, my um yeah, I struggled obviously with alcoholism once I really, really badly once I knew that my playing days were coming to an end. Because, yeah, that was my reward, reward system, scoring yeah. touchdowns, um, you know, cheering, screaming, being happy yes. on the field, et cetera. So, yeah, you, you, you yeah. hit it on the head right there. That, okay. Absolutely. You were correct. Cool. cool. <laughs> yeah, so, so basically it's just like uh, in terms of like uh, willpower, what, what you can do in the moment is basically uh, we just – the, you know, there's a gazillion different other senses, but like the five senses is a good starting point. So, so here, an example is if someone wants to take a bath, you know, that's fantastic because it involves, you know, touching, they can feel the warmth of the bath, you know, they can, they can smell like if there's any, you know, stuff or, you know, as you say, drinking something, it's just basically anything that you can do that involves the five senses that doesn't involve giving in to the urge. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm checking the chat too. RJ, you put something good in there as well um, about, how the sense of smell it can bring back those memories too. Yes, yes. Um, it it it. Uh, my goodness, you smell something and it, and it can literally bring you back to when you were eight or nine or ten years yeah. old. Yeah. So actually, lemon <laughs> propel does this for me. If I okay. if I taste lemon propel, it it brings me back to in my basement on my parents' house playing Baldur's mm. Gate two with my little brother and yep. both of us just sitting there playing it and I. I can see it too, like uh, when that happens. It's crazy how smell it leads to having some of your longest memories or like taste too, yes. like some of your longest yes. lasting memories. Uh, our memories. our sense of smell and taste are surprisingly our strongest memory it, because, like for you, like you said, it, it is it is very important because for survival reasons, we have to have a good sense of you know good uh, smelling memory. Right. Yeah. Yeah, this, indeed. I think this would be a good time too to bring up like when we talk about we talk a lot about like when you when you decide to go sober and to recovery, mm -hmm. it's important mm -hmm. to get a new habit because you're taking yeah. away something that you used to spend a lot of time doing, so you have a lot of time to make up for it. And like getting a new or like a new uh maybe not habit, but uh like a hobby. Hobby, um, yes, hobby. That's yeah. what I was looking for. A new yeah. hobby. Yeah. So like I started cooking more. Um, as part of my sobriety, and that's helped yes. me, and that is tied to the taste and smell as well. Yes, mm. absolutely. Mm. Yeah, and like because cooking does all the senses. Like you have to move stuff with your body. You can see the the food. You, you can smell it. You can hear the sizzle. You know, like uh, if you're frying stuff, like whatever it is. Yeah, I never thought all about five that. senses. I never yeah. thought about that. And also, like for you, Monte, when you're doing stuff, like you, you're you're seeing things, you're touching things, you're you may be smelling things depending on what type of things you're working with, you're hearing stuff. Yeah, all of that stuff. Anything that involves all five senses, the more senses you can involve, the more effective it'll be. Uh, I like this because I see this is what I'm talking about. Thank you for thank you for this information because I'm learning you're helping me learn more about myself. You're helping RJ learn more about himself. You're helping our listeners learn more about themselves. And now you yeah. now saying that to me, now you have me really thinking about more things that I can do, maybe start developing even more hobbies that will give me that reward kind of like football did. And maybe it's fishing where it's all senses, it's smell, it's sight, it's the feeling of the, the fishing pole, it's reeling something in, um, you know, actually having a fish. Uh, as uh, you're, your I don't know if that would work with your germs, yeah. though. <laughs> I'm, a germ, I'm a germaphobe, uh, slight germaphobe. But I used to fish growing up, so it's... Oh, okay. There you go. But, uh, I don't know. I, I I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe like that's something that'll that'll help it's me. A good idea. Whatever works. Yeah. yeah. Any anything that you, you that that you would feel uh, anything that will help you feel like a sense of accomplishment. It's basically anything that you feel like is worth worth trying. Yeah. It's it's as long as you believe it's worth trying, then it's worth trying. Absolutely. Mm. So. Mm. Wow. Yeah. Wow. 
like yeah, like take a take a d- deep breath on that one yeah yeah wow. I, thank you for the i love how like this is a lot of the stuff that we've talked about in past podcasts and especially since like we started the video part two you're putting words to kind of like uh what we go around so like we're at like the moral of the story and you're like telling what the story actually is and now all of a sudden <laughs> what we said makes more sense but we just didn't yeah. have the words to put it into and it's, it's yes cool. like i I'm taking down notes. I'm like, this is, this is awesome. I love learning. Uh, that's Placing the thing I learned concept. about after I went sober is I actually do love learning. And uh, the, I, I love this. <laughs> this is fantastic. Yeah. Placing concepts on our gibberish. <laughs> <laughs> so we appreciate it. <laughs> so I, it's, uh, that, that phrase actually, um, how to say this? I, I want to, that that actually ties in very very deeply to, to something that's also on the list. Um, so so I want to relate this to to the notion uh, to the notion of trauma. Okay, so because it, it, it's this is an extremely heavy term. Mm-hmm. Like, it, uh, but the, the thing is, is um, it's it's worth talking about. So um, I can tell you, I can tell you about uh. Well, actually, if we have time, let me uh, remind me to talk to you about uh, a, uh, a, the, the incident that got me thinking about trauma. But first, let me define trauma and a lot of stuff like and then I'll talk about more personal stuff. Okay, um, okay. So for, for me, there, there's like a gazillion different types of trauma. There's, you know, the obvious physical ones, you know, when someone like mm-hmm. gets injured, uh, it's physically traumatic. There's emotional trauma, you know, verbal abuse, etc. And then there's also other forms of trauma. There's a notion of traumatic loss. Like if someone you care about really, like someone you really care about suddenly passed away, like, right. and suddenly they're out of your life, that, that is a really, really difficult experience. And, or, or, or like, you know, uh, just, yeah, basically anything happened to someone you care about. Um, or if say you lose a career that was significantly, uh, embedded within your sense of self-worth well that that's what's also a traumatic experience so basically the way i want to define trauma is an experience that is so uh ex- extremely painful that it forces changes in our lives because most of the time it's like sometimes things can be stressful like okay that's fine and we'll just get through it the next day it's fine but like trauma is something that actually forces you to actually stop mm. like really forces you to process things so that so like yeah. it, it's it's extraordinarily painful like when someone you know loses a career when someone loses a child when someone loses their sense of safety you know basically uh, that that is extraordinarily painful so uh, so uh the the reason why this is this is relevant is that when i was working with you know people and inpatient people and outpatient everywhere I, when I define this trauma, uh, like just basically anytime people have something very severely painful that required a, an emotional or behavioral or some sort of lifestyle change, I asked how many people did not have that experience in their life? I just asked, raise your hand if you did not have it. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes there would be like one, one person raising their hand and other people like, now stop it, you jokester, you know, but everyone has some sort of deeply painful experience that has led to some changes in their life. You are, like, oof, you are, oh, peeling back the layers <laughs> on, yeah. on me. You are, I mean, obviously in my story, I, yeah, sitting in jail allowed for me to process mm-hmm. a lot. I had a lot yeah. of time to process my actions, process my behavior, uh, my excuses, all of the above. Um, and you're right. I always tell people that too is, um, I'm fortunate to hit my rock bottom because I think it allowed for me to change. Nothing else was going to make me stop drinking. Oh, uh, can I give you a strengths perspective uh, way of thinking about the word rock bottom? Yes, please. Absolutely. Yeah, please. Okay. yeah. Rock bottom is one heck of a strong foundation to build on. Because <laughs> like, like you, got, you got the rock, you, you, it's, you can build upon that. <laughs> wow. wow oh my goodness <laughs> wow that is, that's um, fantastic that's amazing oh my yeah. goodness real quick though side track for audio listeners in the chat jenny 
Thank you for that information about Montgomery. <laughs> I, I'm familiar with him. Pretty cool stuff. Um, but wow, that's that's yeah. a, that's a way, a much better way of looking at it. Instead of saying yeah. rock bottom, you just hit your foundation. That is. I, I went back to my it. fundamentals. It's unreal. Yeah. I need to going back to your fundamentals. I need to get that on a T-shirt or something. Okay. <laughs> Booster. Or... <laughs> That is that would be a really good one. I didn't hit rock bottom. I hit my foundation. Untapped. Tag. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Yeah. Wow. And, uh, yeah. And so one of the things I want, I want to so I, I want to go along this line of uh, the trauma and a little bit more and about uh, putting words to stuff. One of the things that a lot of researchers for trauma have noticed is that. Uh, one part of the brain actually shuts down when people are trying to bring up the traumatic uh, memory, or which is called the Broca's area, which is a part of the brain that regulates turning thoughts into words. Like, mm -hmm. have you ever heard of the term speechless horror? Like, no, or no, people no. just sat in speech. Like, this oh, is this is when, yes. yeah, this is when like people like people like who can't even talk about the trauma. Like that, that is actually a very, very common experience because like it, it will kind of go back to the, to the roots, like mm -hmm. uh, to, of basic human experience. It's like trauma is, is like affecting the body on like a pre-verbal uh, level. So, so this is why like, this is why being able to be, or being able to personally put words to things or having others help you put words to things is an incredibly powerful healing experience because it helps you unwind that that like neurology the, the the neurological pathways in your body that stopped you from talking about the stuff that that was bugging you or whatever that was you know deeply painful etc oh and that's the basis for so, therapy isn't it i was yeah no, i was just gonna say that yeah you know to put words to talk yeah that's that's one of the premise of of talk therapy like as long as like helping people put words to their experiences and then once you have words then your rational mind can start working with it because right because trauma is a very deeply uh emotional thing so our emotional mind is you know likely to just run with it like imagine like the like you know uh is uh, i like to use your example monte like you know waking up in jail or i don't yeah. know like you know just realizing you're in jail yeah. like that, that's an extremely like visceral experience and then but, but like eventually being able to like put words that gives gives like an intellectual structure and ultimately helps you work work with it in a way that allows mindfulness and other types of things to come in basically like mindfulness training is is strength it's basically it's strain strengthening your ability to tap into your rational mind to make better decisions and that and that's and, and that's a lot of what uh, what we try to work with just helping people be able to discuss the the issues better be able to like yeah. think better make better decisions and no oh, jenny oh. actually got to the point that i was about to make too like i think that i, I love that's amazing and it teaches a lot, but also no. that's kind of where toxic masculinity comes from because we try mm -hmm. to keep that rational mindset up front, but really when you keep that emotional mindset uh, subdued, you're not actually using your full brain power. And uh, yes. that's where that toxic masculinity can kind of come from. So yes. like, the mindfulness, going back to our podcast with Chris Borland and going from what you're talking about, Amelie, uh, Mindfulness comes from using both together and yes, that yes. really does make you into your best self. Yeah. It's encouraging, like yeah, encouraging the balanced mind. Mm. Yeah. This is, uh, this is refreshing. This yeah. is refreshing information. Yeah. Um, so like for people, like some people, like their issues, they like their minds unbalanced towards being extremely emotional. Some people mm -hmm. their their mind is their mind is unbalanced towards being overly rational and ignoring their emotions. So basically, like it's just uh, basically developing your toolkit. Like the only thing that a clinician can ever do is help the client develop their toolkit and discover their existing tools, mm. and and help and help them, you know like yeah be willing to work. So, it. yeah. Thank thank you for this information. This is yeah. uh, not only our our listeners gaining some some 
information, especially on a Sunday, it's like, you know, the, technically it's the start of the week and it's, it's the ability to learn new things and obviously to then, you know, tackle your week in a positive fashion. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only are they learning, not only is, is RJ and myself learning, I think we're allowing for our youth who may tap into this, who may listen to, to understand how important it is to just have this self-awareness with your emotions, understanding what certain phrases mean, emotional intelligence or toxic masculinity um, and all of the above. So I'm, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I'm just grateful and I really, really appreciate you joining us. Yeah. But you got more information to talk about here. Happy to be here. <laughs> Let's get yeah. to it. What you got, RJ? So going off of trauma, one thing you talked mm-hmm. about is uh, losing a loved one, losing so- your yes. job. So the how grief can kind of relate to uh, yes. substance dependency. Cause that is, I think that's something that all of us in recovery almost mm. maybe fear is losing a loved one for sure. Or like some deep grief that's going to send us back to it. Because I know um, personally uh, when my wife was pregnant with uh, our second child, the first mm-hmm. childbirth was really traumatic. Um, she ended up oh, having God. surgery for an hour afterwards to, mm. uh, yeah stitch up her um and she she bled a lot and um mm-hmm. i almost lost okay. it so yeah i went through that basically that entire nine months just fearing what was going to come and i was not I, excited yeah. at all and part of it was yeah. how the first childbirth went then part of it is her being a black woman black women are like 300 percent more likely to uh, died yes. in childbirth yes. and socioeconomic status has no impact on that. It's, it relates yes. to all black women. And that mm-hmm. scared me going into the first one. It scared me even more going into the second one. And, yes. uh, so grief and the prospect of grief can put us in a bad place. Yes. So if you could talk about how that can relate to. Yeah. So, so um, the, there's, there's a lot and we can go full circle in like many different ways. Uh, let me read you a uh, something from a, a research article by a couple of psychologists. So it's the article itself. You know, it, it's just a lot of fancy talk. But like, let's see, uh, where was it? Oh, oh gosh. Uh, yes. Okay. Here, there are three important uh, symptoms to to the bereavement or grief process. One is intrusive thought of the deceased the second one is sadness and then the third one is yearning for reunion Mm -hmm. so i'll I'll, so both you know all all of them are important the one Mm -hmm. that i want to uh, emphasize in is the yearning basically wanting the reward of being able to be next to them yeah and never ever getting that reward known and knowing that not only will we never get it right now we will never get it again because we have lost that person like it, it will like we'll never ever get that reward and we've had that reward for you know decades in our lives so like it i'm, I'm in this case it's like the the case of a loved one you know we have we've had this person in our lives for many years we've had you know mountains upon mountains of important experiences with them and then suddenly we know that we'll never ever get that reward no matter how hard we try it's completely 100% out of our power so you can see like how how that it forces the reward center of the brain to go in overdrive it's like knowing that we, we've lost that social reward and we'll always never get it back again so yeah so grief is actually one of the most difficult wow. things for a lot of people to work with mm-hmm. because it, it directly it directly uh like uh how to say it? makes makes the uh the the war system ha- ha- yeah struggle yeah it's a big struggle and, and there is, so this is why like i i include traumatic loss as part of the discussion about trauma okay it's like like uh, if it's okay i like to take your example again monte of like losing your career it was a significant sense of reward and like now and nowadays it's like okay we can't go back to there like uh, theoretically you could probably go always try again but like you know in most practical senses yeah it, it's really not going to happen like in terms of like right. uh going back to the glory days or, or or things like that it's 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 gone so it's like okay what can we do to still feel rewarded you yeah. are you're you're gosh you're so right 
you're so right. And I speak about it a lot is that, um, you know, how do I, what can replace running out in front of 90 to 95,000 people screaming, chanting, um, screaming your name yeah. when you score touchdowns and stuff like that. Cause obviously that reward system, that release of what is it? Endorphins. Is that, is that, is that right? Uh, yeah, I, I basically anything like dopamine endorphins. Dopamine, yeah, yeah. A lot of good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Dopamine really for sure. Stuff. And just trying to replace that with something. But obviously at the moment it was, it was alcohol. It was alcohol for me. Um, until obviously that alcohol became a problem. So yeah, you, I'm sure RJ can relate too. Uh, yeah. It's just like, uh, it, it's like we're, we're replacing one thing with another. It's like, it, it's like it, when, when there's a sudden emptiness, sudden void, nature does not like, uh, people don't like to have vacuums. Nature mm-hmm. doesn't like to have vacuums. Just in general, like it, it, from a physicist, from a physics background, like, you know, nature doesn't like a vacuum. People, like, imagine if there's like a, you're sitting in a room full of people and like, it's just really quiet someone's going to want to talk because like someone gets a little bit weirded out. It's like if people like there, there's, there's like, Oh, when there's an emptiness, people struggle with that. Right. Rightly so because, because people want to like, you know, have something there. That's so true. Yeah. It's funny that you bring that up. They actually teach that in sales too, where mm. it's uh, just the psychology of the mind where it's, if you're whatever, whatever it is you're selling, try not to talk too much. They actually teach you to obviously present the product, the item, what have you, talk about it, but then stop talking just to make it awkward, that awkward silence. And yeah, then yeah. the potential buyer will be like, oh, uh, okay, I'll, 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 I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, g- 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 give that, give that space. Yeah. And this is, and this is again, where mindfulness can come in because mindfulness gives like, it forces the person to be okay with space. Mm-hmm. with stillness mm. with a sense of emptiness because like when we're, like say most people do you know mindful breathing exercise when you do that you're probably not you know uh doing other things so it's like an emptiness of all the other stuff can, can you be okay with just uh, like oh, a person just being there just a, just a single solitary human being with that sense of emptiness and is that okay? Like, you know, is it okay for people to just sit in the calm and the quietness? Like, mm. and the, the more people are more okay with that, then people become more okay with the emptiness. Because let me give you a strengths pers- perspective on the term of emptiness. Yeah. 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 Please. Uh, emptiness is potential. It's like, it, it, think of an empty bottle. You can fill it with whatever you want. Yep. Emptiness. Like, like, the, okay, th- this is, this is after someone has like, you know, gone through at the acute stages of grief. Like when people are going through like the really, really difficult stages of grief, you know, you got to do like very, very targeted, uh, uh, psychological help, like therapy and all sorts of stuff. But like, uh, after someone has kind of gone through the, like the really super difficult part of it, well, think of the emptiness as something that, you know, that's opened up. You, you got the entire life to open up to. So, yeah. I like it. I like it. I like it. I'm speechless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it just makes you, makes you think, you know, deeply. And, um, I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful way to look at emptiness. And, uh, yeah. it's, it's nice to have, to be able to kind of flip it and shape it. And, um, yeah. So, uh, one thing that we missed in the trauma was a incident of your own trauma. If you don't mind talking about oh, this, the story. Yeah. Yeah. No, th- this is, uh, this is not like a, a horrible a story. It's actually one, one of the most, um, fulfilling things, um, which is that when, when I was, uh, still in school, uh, people organized an opioids conference. So like it's a, like, uh, just not just for people who are working in the field, but like for all social workers. Yeah. So in that, in that situation that it, it was, um, it was a lot of different, uh, like, uh, different tables where, you know, everyone just kind of cycles across the table. Like you sit at a table for five minutes 
and then, you, and then you listen to the presentation and move to a different table. So it's like, you know, a lot of like really interesting stuff. Uh, and then there was one table where it was a uh, black students, black uh, community members, black professionals uh, working in the field. And so, you know, they, they gave, you know, they, they gave me important, you know, uh, stuff about like, you know, the history and how, how like the opioid crisis was, was a big crisis long before a lot of people were willing to call it an opioid crisis. All, all, like basically a lot of the important history stuff. And, uh, and then people started talking about, you know, their own, uh, like personal stories of how they lost, you know, people in their own lives. So it was very powerful. And at the end, I wanted to ask them like, what is so let me see if i can remember the exact question so what i asked the the table was as someone who wants to work clinically in this field what is one thing that you would like for me to take away from this like so like basically all the things that they have shared what is one way that they can package it in a way that i that for me to take in my mind as i start doing my clinical work and uh it was uh, I don't. Rem I don't think she gave me her name, but uh, one of the black women who was sitting there was telling me, "Well, keep in mind that almost everyone has gone through a lot of trauma. Basically, almost every single black person has gone through, if not trauma in their personal lives, then generation, you know, like generational trauma. So, like, uh, uh, like she just said one sentence, and then I'm I'm kind of filling in the rest. You know, there's generational trauma, systemic, mm -hmm. you know, issues." everything so so basically the, the more the more i thought about this the more i when i was digging in to my work with clients and do my personal research the more i realized is that basically so much of life is about recovering from traumatic issues it, regardless of whether or not people are willing to call it a trauma or not you know you don't have to call it trauma it's just like a deeply a, a painful experience that forced some sort of change in our lives right so, so a lot of that is about, you know, like, it could be like, say, losing, you know, sense of self-worth. That could also be traumatic. So like anything like that. Yeah. So, so uh, it, it, it was, yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, it, it was, it was one of the most powerful conversations. It was one of the most powerful five minutes that I've ever had. Right. So, so I was, I was going to say, when you, whenever you hear a, a, a pause between you know, RJ and I, after, after you're done speaking, we're, we're, we're processing this information because it's, you're giving us really, really important ways, different ways of thinking about stuff, different ways of presenting yes. information, um, as opposed to just being in the same way that we present it. Yes. Uh, yes. What, what were you going to say, RJ? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, <laughs> I can, yeah, I can I think, definitely see how that would be just opening your mind, being able to see like the most mind blowing, you know, that one sentence just all of a sudden unpacks everything. Cause yeah, you know, I'm, I've, I've talked about this before too. Like I'm a cisgender white man, like yeah. in middle class, I grew up middle mm -hmm. class. So like mm -hmm. I, I didn't really know everything about the real world until, you know, I was in my mid to late twenties. And then when all of a sudden I see it, it's like, it opens up in front of you. It's like, yes. it, it can be difficult to process and being able yeah. to understand that everybody, everybody's trying to get to this level that yes. um, I started at, like, you know, we need to raise that tide up and lift all the boats and, yeah. yeah, I'm I'm very passionate about that as well. That um, I have to yeah. do more to be able to help everybody else. So that's what yeah. that's something that I I I can connect with absolutely. And that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and uh, this is this is why I chose social work rather than going into psychology because one of the principles of social work is not just the person's mind. But the environment that the person is in, mm -hmm. like, uh, like, uh, no amount of healthy perspective can survive like a 
like just a constantly toxic abusive environment like right. and like so so things like that so so like and like you know you can't it's impossible to talk to a black person about their experiences in recovery without talking about how their blackness is involved or yeah. like if so, someone who's white like it, it, whether or not they want it like it's involved in some way even if they're not conscious of it so like everything every aspect of a person's humanity uh is involved the reason why it's important to involve all of them is because again the strength perspective every single thing that's part of your identity can be used as an ally to help you in the recovery journey so anything that you learn about yourself you can use in a positive way just like how anything could be used in a bad way you can use in a positive way i gotta write that down yeah it's like okay well i'm black how can i use that in a positive way i'm white how can i use that in a positive way i i'm you know i'm asian how can i use that in a positive way? i'm you know uh pacific islander how can i use that in a positive like what are some ways we can use that like so it's just it's I, like it, yeah. yes yes i guess i my question my question to you is so so I, and i think i think you may have just touched on that as to you know what got you into social work yeah um, yeah yeah are there any Obviously, without sharing any names, of course, of, of uh-huh. people, any uh, success stories. You know what I mean? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Depression. This is one of the most um, rewarding things about this because, um, so I don't know if you know, so previous to me working as a social worker, I also worked as a professor of mathematics. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so I was, I, I had a prior to this i had gotten a phd in mathematics and i started i was working as a professor but then like i wanted to try other things in life basically i'm just trying out different things in life and one of the things that i decided was that after my professorship ended like was that i could have gone to you know wall street to get money but one of the things i wanted to do is get rewards that are priceless okay. and so here's an example like i i recently um uh, one of my friends got married and uh i i went to her wedding and she she was uh how do i say this she had um and she had like done the catering service you know like we we were in like this room with like you know with with a lot of servers waiters bringing up food and all sorts of fancy stuff so it was a lovely event and one at one point uh someone was saying so my my real name is sam or samantha so the person's like samantha sam sam i was like wait what Who, who's calling my name i'm like wait what what's going on like I, and then i turn around and it turns out to be a former client and she was working there as a waitress and it was it was like a year and a half or a, about a year after i had finished working at, at that place and she and i were just talking just about like you know how her life has been she's been like you know I just celebrated my one year so sober day. Mm. And what I have been doing is collecting all the money that I would otherwise be using for alcohol. Mm-hmm. And now I pick up enough money to give myself a vacation anywhere that I want. There you go. <laughs> there you go. And it's like that type of story you cannot buy with money. Like mm-hmm. those type of stories are priceless and are one of the most rewarding things that ever. Yeah. Like there's going to be a lot of falling downs, but like those type of people who, who, you know, get through it. Yeah. That's what it's all. That's what it's yeah, all it's, about. Yeah. Those success stories are, are, are refreshing, uh, refreshing. I've been saying that all Jenny, Jenny's in here too. I've been, I've been saying that a lot. He's going to come for you. He is my, my word of the day, Jenny, uh, in the chat is, is refreshing today, but, um, that's, but yeah. So something <laughs> similar for me, um, you know going into line work Mm -hmm. sure the pay is good but honestly it's the feeling of when i go like let's say uh there was a terrible storm that went through all of iowa last summer when i got there i mean basically every tree was in the road and uh 200 people didn't have power across iowa and when Mm -hmm. i left there was only a couple hundred people that still didn't have power and you know just when you go into a neighborhood and it's completely dark and we get our work done and you know those 18 20 hour days but at the end of it and you put that switch in and everything lights up like oh my goodness there's no feeling like that (laughs) that you have just helped somebody out and uh yeah it uh, it makes the day worth it it makes 
it, it's not that it's any easier to be, be away from my family, but I'm doing something to, I'm using my skills to help other people. Yep. Yes. That, that is something that helps me every day that, uh, yes. just knowing that. Yeah. And we were talking about, uh, rewards earlier and th think about like the reward of knowing that you made someone else's day. Like, so if we're, if we're feeling kind of bad, what if like, so this is, uh, what I would tell people about why should you go to a meeting? Well, if you're feeling really terrible, like if they're like, I don't want to go to a meeting, you know, if I'll call it non narcotics, whatever, or like or any uh, other types of meetings. Well, you could go there and just share your experience and you can make someone else's day. How, yeah. how much of a win could that be? You know, like just you being there. Like, what if someone was thinking, I want to see RJ. I, I wish, I, I really want to see RJ tonight because like I, I, I value his presence. Imagine like if, when, if he showed up or Monte, I really value Monte's presence. Like just sometimes showing up can be a victory in itself. And that, and like, just like that could help them feel better. Which, and it can also be a reward for yourself. Just like helping people is a very, very powerful uh, way to feel rewarded. Absolutely is. That, yeah. well, Kindness is one of the feel, uh, Regrets is that I don't do more to help people, actually. You know, I didn't go mm -hmm. to a career that could help more people. Ah. Or, you know, that's something that, uh, <clears throat> you know, Ma Mons and I in a text chain were talking uh, a couple mm -hmm. of weeks ago, and I, I said uh, a regret was a waste of talent. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I, I explained that it's not athletic or that I didn't do more in the athletics. It's that. Uh, sometimes I feel like I could do more with my mind, my more to help people yeah. uh, mm, do things just. that uh, I feel like sometimes maybe I wasted a little bit of talent. And that's, that's something that I have to get over too. that where I am and what I'm doing, it could help yeah. people. Like maybe, uh, right. you know, a couple of minutes yeah. sooner we get somebody back on maybe, you know, just uh, sometimes my mind can do things maybe e efficient too. So, uh, you know, a little bit of triage sometimes I'm, yeah, yeah. I can be pretty good at yeah. too. So is it okay if I give you a little bit of like a clinical feedback? Yep. yep okay. So, um, okay. So you have your entire life ahead of you to do that good. Mm. So every day is an opportunity for you to do good. And you'll always have it. <laughs> as long as your mindset's there, the opportunities will come. It's about like, like when, when you see an opportunity, then, then you can do it. Just like it, those little wins, they add up. They add up. Absolutely. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so that is no. Oh, go yeah, ahead. Go, go, you go, go ahead, Mats. You go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say the same thing. Like it's uh, how grateful I am. Again, just, uh, just again, when you're, when you're going throughout this, this podcast, uh, as we've been doing, when you're, when you're meeting new people, when you're talking about different topics and stuff, yeah, at times we may, um, you know, we're talking about concepts and stuff that our low and lived experience when we may be regurgitating the same stuff, RJ mm -hmm. and I, because mm -hmm. obviously he's been in my life for 12 years, dating my sister and then marrying my sister. And so it's just, uh, again, here's for Jenny in the chat. Uh, it's yeah. refreshing to get just this new way of, of, of seeing things. Uh, different perspectives. So different perspectives. It's very, very Absolutely. important. It's very important. Um, but go yeah. ahead, RJ. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, uh, I have a feeling that we could probably go for an hour longer. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. We, we have, this has been a blast. And, uh, is there anything else that you really want to touch on? Um, I know, uh, you know, we're, we're at about an hour 10, but if there's any, okay. any of the other topics that you really want to get to, uh, or we could sum it up, uh, you know, how about I sum it up? Okay. How yeah. about how about sum it up in, in terms of uh, in terms like collecting all the stuff we talked about and collecting Absolutely. it to one thing, which is um, uh, so uh, one of the things I also heard uh, the two of you talk about is like how life has ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Um, this is the last topic I was talking. About. I think. So think about, you know, uh, the graph of a stock market. You see how there's like the ups and downs, ups and downs, ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at any particular moment, there's, there's no like, uh, uh, like you have no idea if it's going to be up or down from one moment to the next. However, um, when you're say like in a good economy, you can see a clear upward trend. Like even though there's up, downs, up, downs, up, downs. Um, and 
uh, how to say it? yeah uh, but you can still see the there's like an upward in mathematical term it's known as a it's a positive drift so um so one of the things that i like to tell people is that sobriety is basically giving you that positive drift like that like like Every single day could be up and down, up and down. But every day that you're sober, you're just adding a little bit more to like that overall positivity every single day. So just like even if things go badly, even even if like people relapse, whatever happens, every single day is a win. Every single day is like a positive step in your journey. That's very true. That is that is very true. It's always, you know, that fail forward in the sense it's uh, that. Yeah, you know, if you do have some setbacks, just they're lessons. They're lessons. Keep moving forward. Um, yeah. Keep moving forward. I. This is a pretty cool conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. I'm glad you guys liked it. It. A breath of fresh air, you know, like a a warm blanket that uh, <laughs> kind of has been wrapped around us. I. I cannot tell you how grateful I am that you reached yeah. out um, and that sure. uh, you came on and I, I would love it. And I think Mons would love it if you would come on again, uh, Please. maybe a couple I'm months sure. from now and we could pick up our conversation from kind of where we left off or touch on some Absolutely. great stuff. And um, yeah. we really hope that you enjoyed yourself as well. This is absolutely yes. Uh, Mons and I absolutely loved it. This was everything I was hoping yeah. to see. I was hoping you'd bring the thunder, and you didn't just bring the thunder; you brought the lightning too. And uh, <laughs> thank you. Oh gosh, uh, <laughs> I did it. I, I'm a dad, you know. You, you gotta go into it. You got. You just gotta lean into the jokes. So yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> so Amelie, where where can people find you? Uh, uh you so know? on Twitch.tv, Amelie of the Sea. Uh, on Twitter at amelie underscore c and then and then like you'll see the links to my youtube and twitch i i mostly i i don't talk recovery but i i am happy to talk recovery with anyone that wants to yeah i mostly play uh video games on, on my twitch streams so yeah what kind of what, what uh what's your favorite game uh, right now, it's a it's a game that's called Satisfactory. It's if like you took the game Minecraft and you okay. took the game Factorial and you put them together. It's like a building game, like a like a creativity building game. So, for example, I just finished building the Empire State Building. I also built like Stargate Atlantis. I've also built like all sorts of other stuff. So yeah, I have stopped in and checked out uh, some of your streams, and it's really really interesting what you're doing in that game and uh i really yeah, yeah. enjoy like your stream is uh relaxing like it's yeah. just yeah i love the way that you uh interact and not just that but how you explain kind of what you're doing and yeah that's it's just like just like here like you you have a way of putting words to relatable uh not just relatable metaphors but the words you choose are just they fit so perfectly into the puzzle yeah. that uh, we've, we've, tried to, we've been trying to build and I uh, really appreciate it. Yeah. So yeah, I'm glad. TV, I'm glad. Amelie of the C uh, at Amelie underscore C uh, mm -hmm. on Twitter. Um, C as in C as in S E A. Yeah. As in body <clears throat> yes, of water. Yes. Body of water. Where can <laughs> they find you Mont? You guys can find me on Twitter at Monte ball 28. If you're on our stream, just check below. Obviously, uh, on Instagram as well, at Monte Ball, um, our untapped cake pages as well. Please shoot us messages, um, reach out for help if you need some advice, what have you, uh, topics, and we'll bring them on the show. But thank you guys for tuning in. RJ, where are you? Um, you can find me on Twitter uh, at It's Trickster, I T Z, the I is the one in Trickster. Also, Untapped keg everywhere, all social media, uh, any podcast service, YouTube, uh, look up Untapped keg. Uh, we come up, actually, I think we're the top. If you search Untapped keg on YouTube, we're the top option. Um, thank you so much for coming through, Amelie. This was thank you. absolutely fantastic. And uh, thank you. it was everything I was hoping it would be. Yeah. Thank you for the honor of being here. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> let's have a good week. Let's, uh, Take everything and frame it in a positive light. Let's use these uh, 
strengths perspectives that we've been learning about. And yes. uh, let's try to be better tomorrow than we were today. Because at least if we don't make it, uh, we tried. Yeah.